What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Heart Speaks podcast. In this episode, I speak with my good friend, Jaden Horn, who is the founder of the new fashion magazine, Swan Ye. The purpose of this magazine is to give people a platform, especially artists and creators, so that they can freely express themselves in an environment and in a culture where free expression has unfortunately become heavily stifled. We talked about how this manifests in the fashion industry, in tech, social media algorithms, the corporatization of our culture, and how all of that is actually undermining our capacity to recognize the fact that A, we're complex beings, and B, we can perceive and deal with that complexity in healthy ways. I really enjoyed this podcast. I think that you will learn a lot, just as I did. So I hope you like it, and I hope you remember to share with all of your family and friends. And I'll see you next time. Um, so I don't know what we're going to talk about. Uh, I want this to be like super, super free form. Um, see where it goes. I decided I'd start by asking you about Swan Ye. And if you could tell us about that and like what you're trying to achieve with it. Yeah, absolutely. So I founded a... Uh, free speech and free exp- expression, uh, fashion and culture publication. Uh, it's print and digital. Um, and it's really to provide an outlet for artists, ideas, and for them to have ownership um, in, in their work. Uh, free from cancel- cancellation and free from like corporatization. Uh, mm. A lot of the in the, publish- in the publishing industry, for your listeners, um, the way it kind of works is two people call the shots. Um, advertisers and what they care about in terms of content and mainstreaming it as much as possible because they want to affiliate their brand with something and get the pluses without any uh, downsides. And then the editors themselves that in general have an ideological POV uh, point of view, and they're really unwilling to deviate from that. Uh, We see that in both bias media such as you know Vox or MSNBC or Fox or Newsmax to supposedly or you know purportedly non-biased media like NPR or New York Times, Washington Post. Um, then in general, their their POV, their point of view is ideological, right? Like mm-hmm. they have a point that they are trying to contextualize everything and frame it as. And what that does is it impinges on writers who want to approach a topic in an unorthodox or heterodox way, but it also uh, is a disservice to readers, subscribers, and people who care about information. Um, And that's the news media. When we get to the fashion media, which is even further downstream of that bias, what becomes uh, ideological bias manifests itself into artistic bias, where the editors decide what is and is not art, and how it's going to be framed. And they leave a lot of designers when it comes to the fashion world uh, out in the cold. They leave a lot of trends uh, really un- undiscussed. They leave a lot of traditions mm-hmm. uh, by the wayside and they don't really explain things. And then now they've become overtly and overly political to the point that it alienates most people. Um, you know, uh, GQ recently put uh, AOC on their cover. Now, mm-hmm. yeah, she's a beautiful woman, uh, ostensibly speaking. Um, and, you know, she looks great in clothes, if that's actually what they were doing. But it wasn't what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were being intentionally incendiary, except that even within the Democratic Party, her favorability is underwater, let alone with other people, uh, independents or right leaners, who would approach that and say, how is that magazine for me if they're putting someone who is akin to putting Trump on Vogue uh, and sending an overtly political message and talking about overtly political things without a discourse from another side within the publication that opens it up. Mm. So we've come this weird full circle where our media ecosystem is overtly political and ideological. And the result is mass conformity and kind of segmentation where people only talk to themselves and there's no expression of ideas. And how that's manifesting is that designers, artists, writers, photographers, videographers, if they think outside the box at all, they're afraid to submit their work to publications because they might get blacklisted. 
because mm-hmm. they dared to think differently. And so Soigne is about offering all of those creatives the opportunity to submit their work, knowing that we are for free expression, expression and freedom of creativity, knowing that we're for elevating ideas, even if I personally don't agree with them. I have a political background. I came from Washington. I have my biases. But at the same time, I'm also open-minded enough to understand that if I want to present a topic such as gender erasure, gender neutrality that is occurring in the fashion industry, that I need to offer a counterpoint so that people can understand that there are two sides of this argument that are equally valid and that in order for them to understand what's going on, they need to hear both and they need to be well-reasoned. And so that is what Swanye Swanye is here for. And then on top of that, it's for gorgeous imagery uh, that's been lost from fashion publications. You know, human beings are visual. We look at things. Yeah, we read things and we're intellectual, but we're also visual. Things catch our eye and we're excited. We want to see gorgeous imagery. We want we want that to be compelling. We want it to be exciting. We want it to be engrossing. Um, and and so you know, we we work with photographers who are able to create fantastic art, videographers who think outside the box. Um, and, and it's something that I'm really excited about because when you pair that with really well done writing and things that are interesting and different and offer a heterodox or in other words, a something outside the mainstream that should be read and discussed, just be put out there, um, you know, it, it provides something that is just different. It's different. And, you know, I'm really excited about it. Uh, Our contributors and our creatives are very excited about it because it lets them be who they want to be and express themselves. And it gives them a platform to do that. And we're happy to do that because the final part is ownership. That as a publisher, we don't say we own your work and we own your ideas. We say Mm -hmm. that you own them and that we pay a licensing fee to you so that you can turn around and have respect, respect and integrity in your work, and then turn around and use it the way you want, not the way we say, which is kind of inverting the entire publishing model on its head. You know, publishers like to say that they own these ideas and these artists and things they create. And we see that in the tech industry. We see that with Disney. We see with all these big companies and publishers have gotten on the bandwagon to control Mm. it, except the creative arts are about expression. And it's, expression that gets ideas out and that gets that gets things discussed. So if we can't express, then what the hell are we doing here? Mm. So, you know, that that's what that's what we're about. And, you know, I hope we shake things up. I know we'll shake things up. Um, everyone I talk to is excited about what we're doing because it's not about what I'm doing. It's not about my ideas. It's about elevating other people's ideas and it allows a maximum amount of people to have input, you mm-hmm. know, and, and in an ecosystem like fashion and culture, where there's so much conformity and so much groupthink, and there's so much genuflecting to whatever the, the, the recent, you know, trend du jour is, it's actually pretty empowering for people and conversations and feedback I've gotten, you know, they just, it breaks the mold. They like, don't understand. At first I explained to people and it, like, it doesn't compute that they can actually articulate their point of view, not what I want them to say, as if Mm. they're like a puppet where I'm sticking my hand up their ass and saying, this is what you're saying. This is what I want. And you're just the vehicle to do it. Thanks so much. No, I mean, that's (laughs) almost every other publication. Instead, it's come to me and show me the incredible level of creativity and art and your point of view that you want to articulate to the world. And we'll figure out how that we can do that. And if it's controversial, then provide balance in another way so people can understand the full scope of a, of a concept or idea. Have you ever thought about your car personality? What's your vibe? Do you like the classic fully gas-powered engine? Are you a best of both worlds type? Driving on battery power while keeping gas on reserve just in case? Or are you more inclined to choose a convenient hybrid ride? Whichever your vibe, there's a Hyundai Tucson to match and powertrain to get you there. Hyundai's 2023 Tucson lineup pairs the tech you want with sleek and stylish designs. They paid attention to all the details, the seats, the dash, the available panoramic roof. You name it, Hyundai thought of it. All while making sure each trim has enough room to hold space for your grocery runs, 
festival nights, and tailgates. Okay, Hyundai. When it comes to your journey, Hyundai is there for every mile. Visit HyundaiUSA.com to learn more about the 2023 Hyundai Tucson. The 2023 Tucson Plug-in Hybrid is only sold in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Can you talk a little bit about how you're seeing conformity or how you see conformity manifest in the fashion industry? I'm far less familiar with that world than I am with politics or philosophy or even tech, frankly. So can you paint a picture of what that looks like? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'll take I'll, I'll take my my first interview and you know, I had this general sense from anecdotal conversations that conformity was occurring. And then I started looking at collections and trends and I started seeing inputs. All right. So I sat down with Nichelle Juliana, who is a Puerto Rican uh, fashion designer in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, And I sat down with Jason Morgan, who is a famous supermodel. He's done uh, Ralph Lauren and Abercrombie. And he was the, the spokesmodel I don't guess models don't really speak, but the the image model for Armani, right? Um, And I sat down with both of them in January of this year. And I really wanted to explore this idea of of conformity because I saw it, but you have to talk to people to see if it's it's real. Mm. And when I spoke to Nichelle, what she explained to me was that there, there really is there really are a couple things, but really specifically that affected her was that she is a uh, self self identifying Latinx, right? So I'm going to use her terms to define her a uh, woman um, who likes to create protest designs and specifically about uh, Puerto Rican sovereignty, about American uh, colonialism there, and how it has impacted uh, Puerto Ricans and. Mm-hmm. You know, on its face, that it sounds like it's interesting. It's obviously a little political, uh, but you know, she wanted to create and show a collection during 2020. Um, she's self-described Marxist. Uh, she's a person of the ideological left. Uh, at the time, she was a professor, and she ran into uh, to just abbreviate this very quickly. The following headwinds: one, in the academic circles, uh, they were not happy about her discussing. Um, this point of view about Puerto Rico, um, even if they privately agreed, they thought it was too controversial. So there was a Mm -hmm. bit of academic censorship of her professional and her artistic endeavors. Um, There was social censorship in the sense that as a uh, Latinx woman who is, you know, Puerto Rican, obviously she would have, you know, uh, white, she would have Hispanic, she may have indigenous, she probably has black ancestors. But during the time of 2020 and Black Lives Matter uh, movement, she was told that, you know, this art is not of uh, importance now. It should not be elevated now. And Mm. her argument to her own kind of uh, intellectual, ideological uh, side, um, allies, was that, no, you're wrong, that we can't just place other people's struggles aside. We need to talk about all of these things. And she was told first nicely, I guess. Uh, that she's wrong. And then after that, she was basically ostracized because she dared to say that actually, um, you know, if we're going to be talking about oppression and systems of oppression, that it's not just limited to uh, white people. It's not just limited to uh, Americans. It's actually other Europeans. It's actually uh, blacks who took over Uh, in Puerto Rico. It's actually uh, mixed people. Like there's a lot and it's not, you can't just dismiss this. And Mm -hmm. so then once she stood her ground in her own circle of ideology, she was ostracized and told basically, look, we don't want you here anymore. Can't be a part of this. Uh, Yeah, bye. Um, Because she deviated, right? Just from like, it it became in that ideological circle that it had to be that conformed. Then finally, the last component is she worked for a design house. And basically what they told her is that you know, companies were very uncomfortable with her personally pursuing this protest design because they did not want to be affiliated with it. So Mm. then the third component of that was essentially corporatism, where corporate, because of their profit motive, uh, wanted to create uh, censored art and, Mm -hmm. and, and wanted to limit her creativity 
and enforce her into a box of conformity within an acceptable norm of, of a sanitized corporate structure. So we had the academic apparatus, we had the you know social and ideological left apparatus, and then we had a corporate apparatus say, hey, you over here who's creating you know some bomb ass stuff, actually, we can't show that, you can't show that, we're not gonna elevate it, we're actually going to suppress it, and if you try to do this, then we are going to cancel you. And ultimately, she was. Uh, she left academia. Um, she temporarily stopped designing because, mm-hmm. you know, you have to be able to make at least some kind of money from it. If if you if your collections are pulled from stores, if you don't have buyers, if if people are you know basically uh, down throttling you on social, mm-hmm. like you you can't you can't work. You can't mm-hmm. do it. So, you know, I heard her perspective. And so I went to Jason, um, who was canceled essentially because he did one tweet during the 2020 election. Um, not much different than this last election with Elon Musk saying, you know, for a balanced government ever vote Republican. He said with a finger pointing up, what a privilege. And I, I believe it was an event uh, for at the time President Trump. Um, he didn't say this is an endorsement. He didn't say I voted for him a hundred times. He didn't say go vote. He didn't say anything other than what a privilege, which in a world where I worked in politics, I can say you know, I worked in the House of Representatives. I worked in the U.S. Capitol building uh, in the speaker's office. Extraordinary privilege. Mm-hmm. Highest privilege of my life. Fact of the matter is, if I had worked in a Democratic administration, I would still say the same thing, because these people, regardless of how we feel about them politically, in terms of their merit and what they do and the amount of stress and everything else that they go through and what they do for our country and the amount of stuff they set aside personally to accomplish this, it is a privilege, period. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree on that. Meeting the sitting president of the United States is a privilege. Barack Obama, whoever it is, because of that simple tweet, he lost a bunch of modeling contracts. He he had his modeling... uh, uh, you know, agreements and 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 sponsorships canceled. Um, and then, because he's a man that doesn't back down, it kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, not his word, but more my like red pilled him. Like he was like, wait, all oh, I did I see. Was this. Yeah, all I did was this. Maybe everything the other side is saying about the things I used to agree with is true. Maybe mm-hmm. they are that intolerant. Maybe they are that rigid and inflexible. And that there's only one way of thinking. And then in my mind, what happens is once, you know, you're the type of personality where they tell you to bend and you don't bend, then you're basically like, you say, F you, and I'm going to do it the 180 degrees different than what I used to before. Mm -hmm. Because truly, what is the point of of complying if compliance requires 100% conformity? You can't even deviate a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so from that, I learned about how, you know, on the right, how he started finding, you know, people who agreed with him, but he felt canceled from mainstream fashion because he didn't comport with what they expected. So that got me to digging more. And so I started talking with more creatives and more designers. And then I got a whole new perspective that essentially our fashion publications, our Vogue and Harper's are dictatorial, that if you do not conform with what their editorial guidelines. And when I say guidelines, I I don't mean like simple things like, oh, your garment should be well-constructed. You know, uh, your fashion show should be, you know, well-produced. I mean, what they say is simply Double Wears Prada. This is the color. Cerulean is the color of this year. And if you don't do that color, you're screwed. You're canceled. You're done. You're never going to produce again. Except it's actually like that. If you don't do what they want, you will not get profits. They will not feature you in their publications. They will not commercialize you. They will not give you a platform. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you dare to deviate from them stylistically, then they may punish you because that's their reputation. Mm -hmm. That because they're the sole gatekeepers, because they're the sole purveyors of what is an acceptable thing at a time. Doing something different is actually seen as an act of defiance that has mm-hmm. to be punished. And so it, it's it's something as 
simplistic as choosing the wrong color or the wrong trend for uh, a season to something big and ideological, um, like what Dolce and Gabbana did, which is, uh, you know, the they're famous gay designers who design for men and women. Mm -hmm. And they said when Vogue decided that, you know, uh, they're going to advance gender neutral clothing lines, mm -hmm. that they just did not believe that was appropriate. And basically the back and forth, if you read the, the, the gossip publications, which of course there's always elements of truth because people leak things, mm -hmm. uh, was basically they were banned from the, the pages of Vogue because they disobeyed Anna Wintour. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I think it's pretty ridiculous that if that even has a grain of truth, that something like that would mean that a preeminent designer doesn't get featured because they have a difference in how they view their own thing that they're designing for their consumer. Mm -hmm. It's not because they're designing shitty garments. Right. Then of course it would make sense. Your standards don't meet the standards of which we're trying to elevate. But instead, you know, uh, a, a totalitarian impulse has infiltrated mm. these publications. And because of that, it means that in order to comply, you must conform. And the problem with that is that the moment, and it's a moral hazard, the moment people start conforming, then they seek to no longer deviate because they're afraid of the consequences because they see these high profile ones. And so what you then see now is three years of collections from designers that look basically the same. Mm. And that the only deviations you see truly aren't actually deviations. There are things that are pre-prescribed as acceptable. So deviations you see this year, the collections, the main deviation is men wearing women's clothes and women wearing men's. Mm -hmm. There was no extraordinary avant-garde. There was no absolutely uh, bizarre use of textiles or materials. There was no inventiveness. Really, it was a social message because Vogue has said that this is what they want to see. Mm -hmm. And so designers eager to comply, eager to show that they are actually listening to what is required, comply. And yet what was lost is where were the messages? You're where speaking, was the type of design that articulated things and trends going on in society outside of that? You're speaking of Fashion Week, correct? I am, yes. And what do you think it is that causes or motivates Vogue to um, hold this standard up as the standard? So I think there's, I mean, there's a few inputs. Um, you know, Vogue is in, in the United States, you know, uh, a well-regarded brand. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And once upon a time was known, uh, Specifically under their, their previous editor in chief, Diana Vreeland, who's actually the editor before the one before uh, Anna, so okay. two ago, was known for its uh, inventiveness, creativity, its uh, nurturing of new talent, its advancement of new fashion ideas. Um, and Anna is known for her exceeding control. Uh, she's known for uh, her rigid discipline. I mean, we can contextualize, I can frame these things as positive, right? She's known yeah. for organizational skills. She's known for her business acumen. She turned the Met Gala into one of the most uh, effective fundraising tools for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, bar none. Mm. I mean, she has many successes. But in general, when someone is a good administrator, in general, they're not a good artist. They're not a good artist. And the problem is, is that for a while she identified that, but like what happens to all incredib incredibly, you know, successful people is they start believing their own lies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she had Andre Leon Talley around her for a while. Uh, and he really was the creative artist impulse that made Vogue at least, you know, a decade and a half, two decades ago, really stand out. Yeah. And then she thought, she acted, I mean, all of this is in documentaries or in interviews that basically he uh, wanted the spotlight and it was all about him. And it wasn't mm. really about art, artistry or creativity. 
and she started icing him out. And the problem is, is that she uh, failed to to nurture and, and grow new artists, designers, photographers, models, the whole ecosystem, and instead focused on manifesting the brand of Vogue out into the celebrity world. And so we had the celebritization of Vogue, where it started being all about celebrities. And then as influencers rose, it became all about them. Mm. To the point where now they are the covers. They're the thing that gets clicks. They're the thing that drives revenue. They're the thing that we talk about when Vogue has something. They're putting Jennifer Lopez on the cover of December. The last I checked, Jennifer Lopez was super important 20 years ago, 10 years ago. <laughs> I mean, lately, I don't know, right? Like, <laughs> But it's a celebrity and it's someone that they can throw on a cover. Now, I think there are far more significant women that are currently doing something now that they could have put on the cover if they mm. actually wanted to do something that made a statement. Mm. But they don't want to make statements except on political matters, which is odd for a fashion magazine. And then, oddly enough, on ideological things, when they throw Harry Styles in a dress and say that that's somehow new, when David Bowie did that, I don't know, 40 years ago. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know when the 70s was because I wasn't born then. But yeah. obviously a really, really, really long freaking time ago. Yeah. So I don't know how something can be new if someone back then was doing it. Mm. And, you know, they pass it off as new because, I mean, most of their audience is uneducated in fashion and trends because they're not actually educating them in that anymore. And that's mm -hmm. the other problem. Um, but the other real issue is that when you have that amount of cultural influence, how you exercise it is a real question of prudential judgment in a real question of how to do it in a way that is beneficial. Mm -hmm. And instead, Vogue has squandered that influence they have in the fashion and cultural and creative industries in the name of really, sadly, because everything is a profit motive, but really in the name of clicks and driving revenue but to the point where, where they monetize everything. So... Are you saying that prior to the reign of Anna Wintour, they were being less driven by profits or their mechanism by which they calculated profits was different? Because I, it's hard for me to imagine a time where they weren't being driven by profit. So can you tease yeah, so, out the distinction? So the entire, the entire media industry and publishing itself has gone through a bit of a revolution, right? And just to give your listeners an understanding. Once upon a time, most things were subscription-based and advertisers were value ads. So they didn't lose money on, on publishing a magazine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people subscribed. A lot of these had circulations of one, two, three, four, five million people um, who paid X amount of dollars a month or a year on top of distribution in stores elsewhere. Um, and then advertisers paid for access to those subscribers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the model inverted mm -hmm. where... You couldn't give, mag and you still can't give magazines away if people think they're not worth anything. Um, and everything is based on advertisers because now we have established brands, most of these, you know, whether it's uh, Time or People or Rolling Stone or Vogue or GQ, they're established brands that have value. So you want to be associated with that value. So you'll pay for access to their magazine as an advertiser um, and potentially access to their subscribers, whoever they are that's left but at least to their distribution network. And that means you are beholden to getting and monetizing every element of the magazine. Because without subscribers undergirding it, just to give you an idea, Soigne is subscriber-based. That's what undergirds our finances. Mm -hmm. Without subscribers, that would mean that we would have to monetize every piece of content. So that means you would come to me with an article. Let's say you wanted about this podcast. I would think about an advertiser that could sponsor that article, that I could write something into it and then mm. figure out how to monetize it. And I might even have to change your point of view. If you say that podcasts you know, are great, but specifically yours is about ideas and, and talking to people that you think are making change in, in our society. And mm. let's say the advertiser looked at that and said, yeah, I want to write about podcasts, but I don't think our society needs changes. We want to distance ourselves from that language. Mm. So now I've, re <laughs> I've rewritten this article in order to comply with an advertiser to make them happy, even though I'm writing about things that are elementally true. Mm -hmm. um, that's the problem with monetizing every element and piece of content. That's the problem with selling your cover and selling your cover story 
That's the problem with making every part of it about what you can get in terms of revenue because your subscribers are undergirding you. Now mm-hmm. you're looking essentially at the wall between editor and business being non-existent and mm-hmm. everything is, how is this business? Mm-hmm. So Jennifer Lopez obviously drives them business somehow. Mm-hmm. It could be a paid placement from her publicist. We don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. Is mm-hmm. she newsworthy and relevant or is it paid placement? Mm-hmm. And if we don't know that it's paid placement, then the average person can't understand why there is value for them, which is why subscribers for most magazines are dying. Mm-hmm. Because when you see something that doesn't seem to make sense, then the only answer is financial. And mm-hmm. if that's the bias, and they don't disclose the bias, that the bias is financial, then essentially you as the consumer are being advertised to without your knowledge. And right. that sucks. Yeah. So what caused Vogue to flip their model, though? What incentivized them to flip their model from a subscription model to a everything is profit model? I mean, so it's not just Vogue, right? Like it's 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 really so Vogue is owned, um, you know, Harper's is owned by these big conglomerates. All right. And whether it's Condé Nast, whether it's Hearst, uh, when the publishing industry, when the floor fell out of the publishing industry, when people started going uh, away from print publications, whether it be newspapers, I mean, this is, you know, most people, I'm sure your listeners are, are well aware that newspapers are dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, traditional media is dying. Magazines less so. Um, but people stopped subscribing because what happened is with the rise of smartphones and the rise of uh, additional ways to segment social media, uh, what you're getting, they just, People didn't feel the need to have a physical Mm. publication. And at first it was a trickle and then it was a torrent of people canceling subscriptions or not renewing. Mm. And so they faced down a crisis in the industry and reinvented. And kudos for these mega companies. They Mm -hmm. still make billions in profit. It's not like magazines are dead. No one should ever take that away from a single magazine. Mm -hmm. They still make money. They're not dead. It's not a dying industry. It just reinvented itself. Mm. And the problem is it reinvented itself in such a way that it actually reduced or eliminated the very reason that it existed to begin with, Mm. which is to provide these artistic outlets, these unique point of views, these distinctive brands. We knew what Playboy was about besides nudie photos. Mm. It also was about really interesting writing. Most Mm. people would say that Playboy during its heyday had some of the best articles, bar not. Rolling Stone was about investigative journalism. I mean, like the damn best investigative journalism. Mm. You would read that, you would find out everything about your favorite rock stars, musicians, celebrities, et cetera, because they got unparalleled access and wrote in such a way that you got to understand the inside workings of someone's brain who that, you know, their publicist spent so much time making an image of Mm -hmm. that you never actually saw. Right. Okay. With National Geographic, we actually went to like the Serengeti and you got to see the photos of these like lions eating a a zebra, right? Mm -hmm. And like that was graphically powerful. And then there was these long form articles describing what was going on and everything else. So there was a purpose to them. But then in reinventing themselves, they've pretty much done away with those distinctives. And they're Mm -hmm. they're trading on their past reputation, both Mm -hmm. for advertisers and for unwilling and unsuspecting and and kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, ignorant or uneducated subscribers. Mm-hmm. And those that are, are the ones that say to me, like, you know, I used to have a subscription to Vogue, but I can't stomach it anymore. It's not about fashion. Mm-hmm. Like, we need an actual fashion magazine in this country. Other countries still have them. Because for whatever reason, other countries either have a, a less insane profit motive, a more dedicated a uh, class of subscribers. I don't know what it is. And I can't, I can't be an expert on those. Yeah. You know? But, but the fact of the matter here is that's what's going on. Mm. And I think when you, when we really, when we really look at what's going on with, with our media ecosystem, it's odd because now we're going back to the subscriber based model. Yeah. Because most people that have something to say, like you know that sure, I could have an advertiser. But look at what happens if they pull out. Look at what happens if they disagree. I need a base of people who are interested in actually what we have to say. Yeah. Because otherwise, what the hell? Yeah. 
I wonder if the people who were trying to reinvent themselves should have paused once they got into the digital landscape and tried to cultivate a subscription-based model on the digital landscape. I don't know if that would have been possible or if it, that idea was sort of ahead of its time, right? Because as you're saying, we are getting back to that sort of model. But I wonder if that would have stopped the floodgates from opening as you're describing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's possible, but you know, you're relatively young. So if you put yourself 15 years ago, you know, you're I, I believe you'd be a teen. Yeah, I would be in my early 20s. Yeah. And I will say this during that time, it was such there was such fear in the publishing marketplace and in what was going on that that was, you know, really what made sense. On top of that, mm-hmm. you know, things ebb and flow, right? So yeah. We've gone, you know, the subscription model lasted for so long. And then we, you know, inverted to this advertiser only really based model and and monetizing content. And now the pendulum has swung the opposite way because a whole bunch of creatives and writers have said, hold on. With the rise of cancel culture, with the rise of wokeism, with the the rise of illiberal uh, mentalities, companies, if they're suddenly taken over by their staff who disagree with something somewhere, once mm-hmm. upon a time that I could have possibly said in the long list of things I've said, and they pull out, our entire financial model is gone. We need to come up with our own thing. I mean, you see this with writers all the time, and they all have these substacks. They're hardly like right-wing dissidents. A lot of them are people on the left that just say something that's different, that an advertiser said, hold on, we don't like that your writer wrote about this, and until they are gone, we're not going to continue our, our advertising. And the writer mm-hmm. says, well, F you, I'm just going to go with my audience of people who like that I can agree with them 90% of the time, but 10%, I'm going to give a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we see that. Like that's, and that's why I think the pendulum has swung back because the illiberal mentality has affected the corporate and business side, which then infringes on expression and speech. And is really, it, again, that's how we go back to Swan Ye. It's the same. It's the same circle that it's that it's that that's causing me to want to do this. It's mm-hmm. seeing those trends and understanding that you know illiberalism is not just a thing of the right. It mm-hmm. is also a thing of the left because everyone likes to be a mini totalitarian. We like to tell <laughs> people what to do. It's human freaking nature. So mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter what your political point of view is if you just disagree with someone. You're like, do it my way or don't. I. I do wonder if the order of operations matters or if I'm just being a little bit um, anal here. But I'm wondering if like the corporatizing mentality itself um, sort of makes it more likely that such an ideological uh, fascist way of being would take over. Like how do these things feed into each other? There's a totalizing effect that undergirds corporatization in general. I know that's a hard word, right? Isn't it corporatization? <laughs> I say it, I'm like, I look at it and I, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's easy. And I just say it out loud and you're like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a thousand percent right. So but I like, think like, yeah, I'll the just, I'll just... operations is hard here because the problem yeah. is that companies expect a certain uh, bias. Staff gets hired and they kind of push things towards mm. an ideological point of view. But then your audience starts getting uh, conditioned to only hearing those points of view. And because you're not fully a subscriber-based model, you're beholden to not displeasing your audience and pleasing your advertisers while at the same time trying to make your staff, who's pushing also ideologically, um, happy. And but this is a bigger macro trend, I think, in our in our culture and society, which is why I founded a free speech fashion magazine. Because mm-hmm. right now we have the absolute the absolutizing of politics, where politics is everything and ideology is everything. Mm-hmm. And it means that if you disagree at all, then that's a problem. It means mm-hmm. that if your politics are different than your your coworkers, you got to go. That means if your subscribers disagree with something you have to say, they have to cancel. If your advertisers don't agree, they have to they have to pull their advertising, mm-hmm. as opposed to advocating for what we should be, which is free expression, freedom of creativity, offering div- diverse viewpoints, and saying 
that our subscribers, our readers have a baseline ability to take in information and feel one way or another about it. And that's good. Mm -hmm. It's good for people to be confronted with things they don't like. It's good for people to think, be confronted with things they do like. I don't believe in this model that social media has essentially created and that now our news media has kind of replicated, which is this, you know, self-selecting biased streams. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. It is also not the real world. In the, the real world, you're yeah. with people who disagree with you all the time. So the problem, the problem, Jay, is that that the algorithm can't read that. If you haven't created, if the algorithm is designed to, you know, read patterns that are of a same sort or of a same system, then not conforming or promoting, you know, being sort of challenged by different viewpoints doesn't, I suspect, I actually don't know if this is true, but doesn't compute with an algorithm that is designed to help corporations simply advertise to their conglomerated perception of what a human being is. It's almost like too much complexity fucks up the algorithm. And so, oh, what it, I, yeah, I mean, right? for sure, it really does. Right. It absolutely does. So, I mean, so one of the chal- one of the challenges, one of the challenges becomes, well, this is a question that I'm interested in, in thinking about. It's like, how do you design an algorithm that can handle complexity and can, can celebrate complexity and incentivize others to celebrate complexity? And I think that that's what you're doing by creating this magazine. Well, first of all, I think it's actually entirely possible. The, the, the algorithms results are based on what we want them to be, mm. period, right? You write it to get the result that you're seeking, which is to optimize revenue and get people to be fed content that they like and agree with, that they're more likely to share. Mm-hmm. If you change the algorithm so that they see things, and I will say an algorithm that is brilliant with this is, you know, the the algorithm that TikTok uses. Mm. Um, they give you things that are completely unorthodox or heterodox to what they think you would like because their objective is to make things go viral by giving people unexpected content. Because when you're mm. when it's unexpected, that's actually when you share the most. That's mm. actually when you react the most, right? Because if you see five dancing videos in a row, and then you see someone running into like a, a car, you're like, mm. oh my gosh, you noticed the car one. Because mm-hmm. you just saw five of the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's just a simplistic way of describing how that that human psychology works. But they're actually brilliant in that. Um, but the rest of them are designed to feed you what they think that you want to see, because heaven forbid uh, that you deviate from that. So you're right. I mean, when it when it comes to the tech companies, they can do things differently. They ought to do things differently. Will they do things differently? Who knows? That's an open question. I think we see their revenues going down, so they may Mm. have to change their business model. They might change their algorithms. But I think the societal damage done by these self-selecting algorithms and feeding people content that they only agree with, that is something that we have to stand against. That is why I founded a magazine that could offer divergent viewpoints of people. And Mm. when I say divergent, I'm not talking about like, oh, we're going to publish something from like a Nazi. That's not Mm. what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that the only way you can actually argue against such ideas is to know that they exist in the first place and to understand what their argument is and then to undermine that argument by understanding another argument. Mm-hmm. That is how we win the battle of ideas. You do not win the battle of the of ideas by being fed things that are comfortable, by being mm-hmm. only told the other guy is wrong and not why they have a critique and why that critique is off base. Mm -hmm. That's what's missing right now. So in my magazine, that is why I'm not afraid to print something that someone is defending women wearing dresses. Mm -hmm. They want to defend femininity. At the same time, we're going to talk about what gender neutrality is. Because the only way that people can understand these things is to understand them in a way that explains what they are so they can actually be confronted with the ideas. Mm -hmm. Because they input and they impact arts and creatives in our culture. They just Mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Things show up culturally that go, that come from ideology. 
they show up in our politics, which actually comes from culture. It's not the other freaking way around. Mm-hmm. Not everything that is created has to do with politics. For God's sakes, we can look at the, at the, the Sistine Chapel and say that it's beautiful, or you could walk into the Sistine Chapel and be someone of a, of a different religious background, let's say, you know, Wiccan, and say that's hideous because it's, it's all <laughs> debased art. Mm-hmm. We can look at something like, you know, shit covering the, the, you know, crucifix or whatever. Yes. You know, yeah. the, you know, the Virgin Mary and be offended, or we can look at it and say, okay, what are they going for there? There mm-hmm. actually is a statement, right? Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. is still art. Art can be both sacred and sacrilegious simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. And it can be appreciated and hated at the same time. Yeah. We can do that. We can. We're human beings that can do two things at the same time. And yeah. I believe. So my my perhaps obvious next question is, are you inviting writers for your next publication to talk about Kanye West? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Someone wants to talk about him. I mean, there's I think there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah. You know, there's open questions on, you know, the nature of where his perceived anti-Semitism comes from. Does it come from mental health? Does it come from biases? Does it come from a, a black background? Does it come from experience? Or is it true like racism? And or the is reason it all I of the differentiate above? those, I mean, the reason I differentiate those is because, you know, it's if it's mental health, then that's a whole nother question, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, we that's a lot to to unpack and explore. If it's other, if it's the other ones, then there is some kind of experiential bias that occurred. It's mm-hmm. really no different than someone um, who, who exhibits racism because growing up, all of the bodegas were owned by Arabs and mm-hmm. they got cussed out by them. So then mm-hmm. as an adult, they say things that are very racist about Arab. And then you dig underneath it and you finally get back to their only interaction experience and understanding was that. And that's mm-hmm. where it came from. And then you have to unpack that bullshit and get them to the point where it'd be like, yeah, that's not everyone. That's mm-hmm. a stereotype that, yes, your experience created, but it's still a stereotype. Mm-hmm. Just because one old lady was mean to you as a teacher, and that was the only old lady teacher you had, doesn't mean all old ladies are mean, even though they mm-hmm. are. But you know what I mean? <laughs> it's the same type of thing. It's just self-conforming yeah. bias. And so that's what I'm saying. You know, We are so quick. Now, if it, we get down to it and we find out that at the base level, the man just hates Jews, then yes. Outside of all of that, there's unequivocal condemnation of him as a person, not his viewpoints, because that's how we have to differentiate it. That's the difference when we talk about things. I am highly offended by the things he said. At the same time, I'm also highly offended by things other rappers say that Mm -hmm. don't seem to get any attention. Mm -hmm. And that's also problematic. You know, like it was because his political viewpoints changed that he became suddenly persona non grata and therefore able to be canceled and burned. But I mean, we have Jay-Z who founded a record label because he wanted to separate ownership from the black community from the Jewish community. And literally no one says anything about that. Mm. And he's like invited to the White House and like lauded as like a dope billionaire. Oh, okay, cool. Just just wondering, you know. Is that problematic? Just mm-hmm. ask him for a friend. I have no friends, but ask him for my other personalities. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would, you know, I have a very Zen mentality these days. So my approach to Kanye I at, envy you. <laughs> at all is extremely informed by that perspective. I think it's probably all of the above. I think. It's almost never the case that a person is just racist. I don't even know what that means, unless they're a psychopath. And then we're in the realm of mental health, right? Um, so, yeah, I I do think that what you're saying about the capacity to comprehend something as both sacred and profane, or as both sacred and sacrilegious simultaneously, is... Um, harder to do when we live in an environment that transmits the value of corporatization, which is to say conglomerated form 
in one singular fashion as a value set. And I think that there has been a lot in Western culture, perhaps, that has gotten us to this moment. Um, And that although there are perhaps entities that we can blame for moving this along simultaneously, again, this is my Zen talking, (laughs) simultaneously, there's like no one to blame because there's all these factors and movements and, you know, counter movements happening whereby just like, you know, even our, I mean, I would ask you this question, actually. I had a conversation with someone who was talking about the concept of objectivity. And objectivity has been lambasted as a function, actually, in anti-racism spaces, been considered racist. And that idea used to trigger me uh, a great deal. But then I started studying quantum physics. And what I realized was that, or I asked myself the question, might this failure to articulate in a cogent manner on the part of folks in anti-racism spaces uh, that we are all complex uh, and we are all actually sort of like not caricatures, might the failure to express that actually be behind a... um, wholesale lambasting of the concept of objectivity? And if so, how do we respond to what's behind the failure as opposed to the failure itself? Because if we just respond to the failure, then we might actually perpetuate that failure. Does that make sense? I said a lot there. <laughs> you, you said a lot, but I followed all of it. So first thing I'll say is, I believe that there is objective truth. I don't believe that there's such thing as objectivity. Mm. Uh, how it inputs it impacts uh, anti-racism thought that that I'll get to in a moment uh, because I disagree with conclusions, even if I can agree with a presupposition. Mm. So at Swanye, one thing we do and we believe in is this method of writing called authentic authenticism, which mm. is that we know that there is bias. Mm. So therefore, we expect that all writers approach things, all creatives approach things from their bias and they're Mm -hmm. honest and open about it. There's no such thing as objectivity. You cannot look at something and say that it is because it is. There there are your biases and you need to be open about them because that's called honesty, first with your (laughs) own self, intellectual honesty, but honesty with your audience so they can understand your perspective. It is, after all, from your eyes that you're seeing something not Mm -hmm. someone else's. You're not inside their head looking at it. You're not Mm -hmm. from their viewpoint. I'm looking at this camera head on. If someone was sitting next to me, they wouldn't be head on. There's Mm -hmm. two different things. We need to be honest about that. Period. The freak end. There's just nothing else to say. Yeah. That being said, conclusions from saying there's no objectivity, Mm -hmm. that is a whole nother argument. Because that ignores the fact that there's still something called objective truth. I am, in fact, on camera. I am in fact <laughs> being recorded. Yeah. These are not things that are disputable. We yeah. have to agree on certain baselines of objectivity, of objective truth, even if we are biased in how we perceive them. Mm-hmm. And that is where I where that is where I make the distinction, especially if we're talking about things in the anti-racist circle, because what happens is we start con- contorting the inputs to get the output we want, which is to say mm-hmm. that systems are ingrained and designed to make the outcomes that we're seeing, as opposed to somewhere along the line, there is human agency and there Mm. is individual responsibility. And I know those words aren't in vogue, but I will say, period, the end, objective truth. Creating art is actioned agency. It is the epitome of individualism. Mm. If you are doing something, you are doing it of your own volition, from your own viewpoint. It is individualistic. It is creating. It is actioned agency. Even if the output is something that someone says is expected from society, Mm -hmm. and if the input is saying that there's objective truth, you still are doing something. It Mm -hmm. is actioned agency. There still is individual responsibility, accountability, and choice. You chose to do something. Mm -hmm. You actioned a choice. We are not removing that from people. And that's the problem, I think, 
you know, not to delve deep into those theories, but they eliminate that there is a human element that has volitional control of what's going on. We just are not atomized individuals that follow predetermined routes. Mm-hmm. We can be steered towards those routes. We can, it can be expected that things happen, but guess what? People still make fucking different changes and choices and everything else. Like it's not just things are the way they are. And that's my, most of my problem with those theories is they're very reductive and they seek to uh, eliminate uh, variations. They mm-hmm. seek to act as if they don't exist because that helps with, with their central theory. Uh, but of course, the problem with that is that it ignores objective truth, which gets back to the whole point of my my answer to your question. So I will say this. In looking at quantum theory, in looking at uh, people in, in complex, people are integrated, whether they want to be or not. They are both incredibly complex and incredibly simple. We can be simultaneously both. Mm. People can be so thin-skinned that if you tell someone that they look ugly and you didn't quite mean to say that way, they're going to be offended and treat you like shit. (laughs) But they also are so complex that probably they are internalizing that in such a way and being like, well, how did they mean that? What do they mean? No, they're totally wrong. Let me process this. Well, everyone else says I look great. So why that person say that? Maybe something's wrong with them, blah, 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 blah. Like something as simple as that. People Mm -hmm. do respond like emotionally super simplistic. I'm hungry. I must eat. I'm going to be angry. But also we could sit there and be like, let me look at this menu. And even though I'm hungry, I've been confronted with 10 restaurants. I don't like any of them. I don't want to eat any of that. And I don't know what I want. We sit around for 50, 20 minutes, two hours trying to figure out what to eat, even though we're hungry. Right? Like that's a complex behavior, even though there's a simplistic input that normally would drive a simplistic response. And yet that's not what happens Mm because we're human. It's fascinating to me. I'm realizing that there's a synergy between certain let's call them theories and anti-racism and corporatization. I mean, there are, right? Like a lot of these things are similar trends. They have similar ideological inputs. And uh, oftentimes there's cross-pollination, like cross-pollination. And so one type of theory that's contemporaneous with another kind of uh, colonizes, pollinizes with uh, kind of a fellow (laughs) theory. And they kind of like evolve and mutate and, change then like every theory, they kind of like wither away. Uh, I'm hoping a lot of these wither away because I think they're not necessarily beneficial to the fabric of society. I think in general, questioning is good to the fabric of society. I think destroying is not necessarily good to the fabric of society. Uh, You know, like in general, I'm I'm someone that believes that to evolve is better than to tear down. Uh, Mm. But that's, that's just ideologically speaking, you know, I'm more of an optimist, a uh, yeah. cynical optimist, but, you know, I'm a classical liberal. And I believe that ultimately that to build a better world, we have to start it with building better people and, and ensuring that people are informed and that we appeal to their higher nature. Have you seen Don't Worry, Darling? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, I would recommend watching that and then we can talk about it later. But anyway, okay. I, br- I bring that up because it's very interesting. Like the the director who I believe is Olivia Wilde built the villain to model Jordan Peterson. Now, I think she, oh. fa- I think she failed abysmally. I-, I promise there's a point related to what we're talking about here. Um, I think she failed completely in, in doing that. And um, however... There's a through line in the film and the through line or the message is basically don't become so obsessed with order, right? And conformity because the the, the people in the film who are obsessed with order are particularly the men. And the reason why they're obsessed with order is because, you know, in theory, absolute order means a perfect world, right? A perfect utopia. Um, (laughs) And what I'm realizing, what I'm realizing is like, so it obviously ends up being a, this whole dystopian nightmare or whatever. Of but course, that's what always I, what happens. What I'm realizing is that if I look at someone like Ibram Kendi, who I used to have, I think, a sense of bitterness towards, and I don't have that feeling anymore. But if I, if I look at his, his theories, what I see in there, right, the only, the only solution to, you know, 
racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination um, informed by equity. I'm seeing a very corporatized, ha- like introduce, try to have total order essentially such that we can uh, not only predict, but manifest outcomes. And the problem with the Kindian model, the problem with the corporatization algorithmic model, the problem that I think Don't Worry Darling tried to sort of hint at, and what is, is its absence of what you would call objective truth, but what I would call the, an understanding of the sacred mystery at the heart, that is at the heart of what it means to be human, such that there's always going to be a mystery inherent in being itself that you can't predict that you can't uh control that you can't you know sort of like cookie cutter your way into perfectly advertising something to right and the failure to understand that is not only you know wreaking havoc on society it's also deeply tragic because there's something beautiful about that in an artistic sense there's something incredibly beautiful about that and if you're not capable of perceiving that, then I would say that your life is, is much worse <laughs> than someone who can perceive it. I think people can perceive it. The thing yeah. is, is that I think there are personality types that, steer, that stare into the chaos, that stare into the abyss, and they want to create pure order because any idea of chaos is so anathema to them. I think mm. the Kindian model, I think people who find the solution to problems that they see in society, the reason that the solutions require so much control is because they want a utopist outcome. Mm. And in order to do that, they have to remove the essential aspect of human beings, which is mm. choice, agency, and our own kind of what you would call sacred, mysterious manner of how we come to conclusions and actions and everything else. And they want to order it all. Mm. And in creating order to all of this, you, you must crush dissent. You must yeah. crush creativity. You must crush and make people conform. And then deviations from conformity must be punished, period. Which is why they all result in dystopian hell holes. Right. I mean, and, you know, I'll say that when we look, you know, I, I can't speak obviously to uh, what Olivia Wilde did, but I can say that in most cases, when we're trying to demonstrate these caricatures of men or women or of other races, we tend to do things that in actuality and ascribe to them our own biases as opposed to mm. things that actually are. You know, um, yeah. in fact, the in fact it matter, um, uh, in the corporate world, if we look, you know, men are far more likely to encourage and mentor other men. There is a mm-hmm. reason there's no like men's groups at, at at companies. It's not because they, you know, are trying to compete with women or that they're equal or men are already control companies. Is that men actually do that? The reason they have to create women groups is because as a whole, it is perceived both by women and men, that women are far more cutthroat and they're not willing to Mm. mentor. So they have to create these mechanisms to mentor or encourage fostering of mentorship. And that is a gendered expectation on both men and women when they look at that, that almost every company has this. Mm. And no man ever says, I'm a man, I want to be a mentor. Men naturally do that. And so to say that men like order, I think is so funny. Yes, I think human beings like order. But in general, I think when we talk about who likes power, power, mm. that is an open question about mm. which gender is more likely to want to accumulate power. Because I, I generally believe that if you're willing to pass the baton, if you're willing to train and teach others, then you're less about power, more about legacy. If you're mm. unwilling to do that, you're probably more about power and less about legacy. And mm. those are two different dynamics that we don't really have time to get into that go into self-motivation uh, for why people succeed. Mm. You know, royal families are successful because they create legacies. Mm. Dictators are successful because they cared about power. In general, they don't have legacies because mm. they couldn't groom a successor. Mm. But we know the dictators. We also know the royal families. 
So, you know, there are two, there are two sides of a coin of how ego works. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that, but maybe we can talk about it offline at some point. Jay, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for coming on the pod. This is going to be great. I have no doubt our listeners will have a blast listening to this conversation. I certainly did. So thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye-bye.